The Building Better Business podcast is the best place to learn how to take your business to the next level. It's no longer enough to earn good profits. You need to develop a network of connections as well as use all types of marketing to your advantage that will put you over the edge. Hosted by me, Steve Eschbach, a financial executive with decades of experience in dealing with businesses and business people, we'll learn how this all comes together. Join me and my expert guests as we delve into the many facets of owning the business and how to become a good, caring business owner. Listen how making a difference in your community can attract all sorts of clientele, which in turn will build you a better business. Greetings of the day, my fellow listeners, and welcome to another edition of Building Better Businesses. I am your host, Steve Eschbach, and I am the owner of Transworld Business Advisors. I'm one of seven business owners, uh, Transworld Business Owners in the Chicagoland area. A little bit about Transworld. We are a mergers and acquisitions firm. We cater mostly to the smaller size companies, but we are the largest business brokerage firm in the world, and we are also the fastest growing. And I'd like to... Uh, uh, welcome our guest today, Sean Karami, who has a consulting firm, but he's got a very interesting background. In fact, his current consulting firm was not one that he sought out to start himself, is people were asking him to start this up. So, Sean, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about who you are today and what you're doing. Well, hi, Steve, uh, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, first of all. You know, I'm what you would call a serial entrepreneur. I have started, have founded, and managed uh, over a dozen businesses from uh, zero employees all the way into mid-sized companies. Uh, I've grown them that way. I started when I was uh, in high school. That's when I had my first business. And in fact, I can point to events as early as uh, when I was seven years old that really influenced me, not only to becoming an entrepreneur, but how I handled businesses as I went along. After high school, I did go to college. I got degrees in mathematics, economics, uh, computer programming, and I also got a law degree. And I also got uh, formal training in marketing, sales, and accounting. But while I've done all that, uh, one thing that I haven't done is I've never actually held a traditional job. I've never received a W-2, unlike most people that that uh, I meet. I've uh, never received a W-2 from any company that I haven't owned myself. And I've had huge successes along the way, growing companies to eight and nine figures in revenues, and also phenomenal failures where companies have completely collapsed on me. And I think it was because of that, uh, that family and then friends of family and then friends of friends started coming to me with everything. I mean, business ideas. They wanted to partner up on something. They had a business that was having huge challenges they needed help with, or they were getting, a, you know, they had phenomenal success but didn't have the infrastructure to handle it. And as you know, that can become its own problem. I've also handled a whole lot of mergers and acquisitions. I've done somewhat with clients, but a lot of it on my own for businesses that I've owned or wanted to purchase. um, I've done a lot of that. But what, what happened was because of friends and family coming to me, it just mushroomed so much that I decided to set up my own personal website and put together a small team just to handle those inquiries on a pretty limited basis. We, we are very selective as who we take on as clients in that uh, while I run my other businesses, because it's very common for me to be running more than one business at one time. So that's a little informational on, on me. So uh, the one thing I can tell you, Sean, is that I got you beat. You started at seven. I think my first business was a lemonade stand at four, but that only had a 15 or 20 minute life cycle. And that was the end of that. But, <laughs> so as a kid, it looked like you were always entrepreneurial spirited. Is that right? Everything you wanted to do on your own and kind of form on your own? Yeah, you know, um, look, I'm a first generation immigrant. I was born in Iran and I moved over here when I was in junior high. My father was a business owner in in Iran, uh, so I had that kind of in me. And the funny thing is when I say seven years old, when I went to first grade, my first day was I went to first grade. My father had given me my, my notebooks and my books to take with me. And during that day, some older kid came and took away you know, some of my notebooks. My father picked me up that day and he said, I said, hey, you know what? I need, I need new notebooks. He turns around and says, what happened to your notebooks? This kid took them away. And my father, literally in traffic, just pulled over and he turns over his shoulder and, and he looks at me and he says, tomorrow, you're going to go get your notebooks back. Um, and if you don't, you're going to have to deal with me. 
And the next day I went to school and kind of by force, I got much of my stuff back. Uh, some of it was not recoverable. But when I came back, first question from my father was, where's your stuff? And uh, I showed things to them to him. And he just turned to me and says, you know, what's yours is yours. You just always, always remember that. And that stuck with me, not because, you know, I, you go and fight people for things like that. That's not what he was trying to teach me. What he was trying to teach me is don't let anyone bully you out of what you have. And don't let anyone bully you out of what you want to do. And that always stuck with me. You know, I'll tell a second story. When we first moved here, I was about 10 or 11 years old. My father uprooted his entire life. And for people, you really don't have an idea of how that is until you actually go through it kind of, because you have to think about it. You have your own business, you have your own everything, and you just get up and move to an entirely different country where your credentials may have no value. Your work experience may have no value. And there are language barriers, there's cultural barriers to uproot yourself like that. And we did it because of the Iranian revolution it moved over. But, you know, that was a huge sacrifice that my father made because of us, because of his kids. Um, he was fine where he was. And so my dad would sit with us every day, every day and translate our textbooks to us when we first moved over here. Wow. It taught me a lot about what you, the lengths you have to go through and the, the sacrifices sometimes you have to make and the adversity that you have to get through in order to be successful and to so sort of push those things aside and move forward regardless. And so those things really helped inform the way I was. And I'll tell you a third quick story. I'm moving to 12 years old. Um, by that time, I now, now I, I can speak English and I've become um, kind of rambunctious because what I'm doing now is I was going to the public library, which we would do as kids every day under the guise of doing homework, but it was really to goof around in the public library. And so what we would do is we were only allowed in the children's section. We were under 13. Uh, we couldn't go to the grown-up side. And the only way you could go to the grown-up side is if you were checking out a book over there. So we always would sneak our way into there and there were librarians who would spot us and kick us out. But me and two of my friends were over there. We were in the stacks goofing around and suddenly this librarian that I, at the time, at the time I, I regarded as evil, but he was coming along. My friends dart in two different directions. I'm stuck there. I just go like this. I reach and I grab a book. That's the only thing I could be doing is checking out a book. Well, that librarian would stare at us every time we would do this, you know, hope against hope that we'd actually start reading. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's what he was doing. He wasn't trying to catch us. He was trying to kind of get us to get interested in that thing that we were pretending to read. Well, I never put that book down. That book was Unsafe at Any Speed by Ralph Nader. Now, Ralph Nader later on got into too much politics in my mind. And that really is not what, what is important to me about him. That book changed my life in the sense that I noticed the Middle Eastern name and I started researching this guy. And one thing that I picked up on is he was the father of really consumer advocacy in our country and uh, product liability and forcing particularly GM to change its ways and create safer cars. But one thing he also did was he was so determined and so confident and so so unmoved uh, by all of the challenges because GM actually went after him. They had private investigators on him 24 hours a day, cameras into his bedroom. And this guy, one Middle Eastern guy, you know, who I identified with because he was Middle Eastern, right? He got the US Congress to force really the jewel of American industry at the time, GM, to send its president, no less, to come in and apologize to one guy, right? Wow. That changed my life, right? If he can do that in this country, if that's what this country is about, then look at the opportunity that's out there. Look at what we have. And, you know, years later, I went to that librarian and I told him that one stare he gave me, that changed my life. So that's what, those are the things that kind of influenced me and forced me to into, you know, taking chances and doing these things because I know I can, here we can. So Absolutely. anyway, those are just three quick stories to tell you. Wow. You know, there's so much just in what you had said and that those few stories that we can expand upon, but uh, you've been through a lot. I mean, with your degrees and, and uh, I mean, everything from law to marketing to math, I mean, it, it runs the gamut. So out of all of that, 
Now you've bought a few businesses, maybe it's more than a few, you've sold a few businesses. Let's go back to the building better businesses theme. Yeah. So yeah. take a couple of those companies that you uh, bought, grew, or yeah, are you either started or well, bought? I'll, I'll st- uh, yeah, what, what I mean, the- I'll start with my first business, which really it, it informs us to exactly how I came about doing this. The, the way it came about was really my father and I saw some of his friends, they had small income properties. They were having huge challenges in managing them. They were having trouble with marketing them. They were having trouble with managing the finances, the maintenance and all that stuff. And really in their minds, they didn't see the benefit of getting a management company. It was in their minds was was too much of a, of a barrier. So they felt that they should be self-managing and they were terrible at it. And my thought was, okay, this was right when personal computers were getting into homes, right? This is in the mid 80s. So what I did was I put together some programs for them. Uh, And this was mostly, again, started with my father to be able to one market his company, his properties, to manage these expenses uh, and manage maintenance in a very efficient way. And three, to be able to deal with the revenues in an efficient way in order to actually not be negative, not be out of pocket on these things, because a lot of them were. This sort of mushroomed from there to me providing these services to various people, not my father. I mean, it's just out of that, just recognizing a need and saying, how am I going to fix this need? Because I, you know, at first try to make my father's life easier, but how do I make everybody else's life easier uh, by doing this? And it sort of mushroomed from that and it became its own business. And what I noticed was that's the way I come up with businesses is even when I'm inside of a business. So I started a law firm. During that time, what I noticed was both insurance companies and law firms were in need of certain services and they were not so good at doing them in-house. Uh, they were very specialized services. And so what I would do is I, I started services. I started separate LLC to manage my own business but also servicing my competitors, what I call, and this again and again and again happened because what I call is back officing other businesses is what I was doing, is finding a certain need that they had, uh, that my own business had, and then my competitors had, and then selling all of us on that need and then going into other industries that had the same need. And, And believe it or not, it happens all the time. So identifying all these different markets that would have the same need. And I would go and uh, start marketing that business into those other markets. And a couple of those times, the business that came off as an offshoot, what I felt was a side hustle, ended up being much bigger than the original business that I started. So that, that was very common for me. Yeah, it sounds like that you are one to observe and then respond accordingly and then provide the need that solves a problem that's out there. You know, it's amazing. I have my uh, my bachelor's degree was in finance and accounting, but do, do I do my own accounting? No, I have a firm that does it. I could probably do it, but I'd spend more time staying up to speed on all the pronouncements and the accounting policies that I might as well hire a firm that stays on top of that day in and day out and I do what I do. And it's kind of like the same thing you have. And basically, you know, just by observing what else is going on out there and identifying the needs that people need and you being able to provide that. I mean, it goes like you wouldn't hire an electrician to do your plumbing work or something like that. It's being able to have people who can uh, enhance what it is you do with the expertise that's needed. I guess that would be a, a great way of summarizing it, right? Yeah, you know, and and you mentioned accounting. You have a lot more accounting training than I do, probably. But I always tell people I know enough accounting to be dangerous, right? (laughs) So yes, I can read financial statements if you go through a process and show me what what's happening. But I would never dream of doing my own accounting. I absolutely, I do the exact same thing as as you do. And part of what I do is actually get expert counsel. Is make sure. You know, a lot of us, when we're small businesses, a lot of us don't have the resources to do a lot of these things. But to the extent possible, to the extent you have the resources to bring in expert counsel and build a team and then look for where you're needed. What is your superpower that you're going to be able to inject into that to make the difference, to make it a better business, to make it a successful venture? Too often, I see people kind of sitting there and right now I'm I'm negotiating with someone on a business deal where they're sitting there and their belief is that I can do all of this myself. And my answer to that is maybe you can. 
And I wouldn't doubt it. But why? When you can in certain in various areas bring in expertise that actually uh, will make it a much better venture. To me, if me and you are doing business, it's not one plus one equals two. I want one plus one to equal four. Um, and a lot of times that's what people miss. And yeah, at the same time, what you can do is look for different areas. And, and again, this negotiation that I'm talking about right now, I'm doing, we're identifying different areas where I could do, we could bring in certain expertise that would completely, you know, accelerate growth beyond what they've ever noticed. But at the same time, you have this hesitancy on the other side where people think, oh yeah, I can do, I can just do everything myself. It just doesn't you know, happen. As yeah. Well, you know, there's so much more we could talk about, but I want to ask you two specific questions. Of all the deals you've done, what went the smoothest? What were the, the things in place that made that transaction go the quickest, smoothest, and probably got to the top dollar? What was the most challenging of all the ones that you've done? And hopefully we can do that in less than three hours or something like that. What do you got? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could go in hours on these things. You know, honestly, the venture that I liked the most, that I was happiest with, was when I, I started a small uh, restaurant chain. And what happened was, uh, I think the reason for that is that when I did that, I put together the best team possible. So it was a very big team effort. And I brought in experts in terms of restaurant management, in terms of uh, who was doing the actual work. We looked at how, you know, we had experts on where exactly we were going to put up our restaurant, how we were going to market it. We had the right capital in place and it just all worked. It, it just all worked. It was smooth as can be. The venture took off. It immediately was, you know, it, it wasn't making money immediately, but incredibly quickly and beyond our expectations, it started uh, actually being profitable. And I'm no longer invested in that venture, but that particular venture was, was a fantastic, uh, you know, conglomeration of, of the right stuff that came together. On the other side of it, I've had phenomenal failures. I mentioned that. And it's important because those things really matter. You go through some really hard times on these things and people have to realize that. And all of us have been through them. And so in one of the law firms that I had, I had a phenomenal collapse. And the collapse was because of exactly those things. I had the wrong type of capital, the wrong people that I was negotiating with on, in that respect. And when it failed, it failed phenomenally and it had cascading effects that I had to deal with for a period of years. So, you know, but again, that's what I bring a lot of times too, in that I look at something and, or people come to me and I say, I've been there. I've been exactly where you have. There is virtually no one that comes to me in a small business that says, oh, I've, I'm facing this situation. And I don't say, oh, I'll have a story for them. Yeah. Yeah. And don't worry about it. We've all been through these terrible times and we've all been through great times. So, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's interesting you mentioned that, Sean, because um, uh, you call them failures. I've had so many of them that I no longer call them failures. I call them learning experiences. But if you talk to anyone who's been successful, they'll you ask them, what is a, a huge part of the success you've developed? And they will tell you the mistakes I've made in the past enabled me to do what I do better. And I remember when I was in college, a Harvard Business Re Review story that stood out in my mind. It said at Har an MBA is worthless until he's been fired from his first job. <laughs> and the whole thesis behind that is that you've dealt with adversity and you were able to rebound. If you never have a failure, you won't ever be able to do that. So uh, that's critically important. My goodness, there's so much more we could talk about, Sean. Unfortunately, we've come to the to the end of our 20 minute allotment. I can't imagine there isn't anything we haven't covered. But what other message in your mind that we haven't talked about that you want our audience to know before we end this call? Well, you know, one thing is I'm an avid reader, and despite the fact that I notice these things inside of different businesses, what I tell people is that. I sit there and I learn about those things. As soon as I say, oh, there's this business need, you know, it's very important to go and read, go and learn, get really educated on something and also seek out people like yourself, Steve, you know, come to someone and say, hey, you've done this. What do you think of that? And it's very, very important. And I, I just hope that people do that. Yeah, I'm going to add one little plug for Transworld. So Transworld is owned by United Franchise Group. And I'm going to mention Ray Titus, who is the uh, chairman of United Franchise Group. Uh, he reads a book a week. 
makes it a point to read a book a week. And then whenever he gets the team together and he asks these little quizzes, always the prize is he hands out a book. And that yeah. goes to show you how important reading is. And I'm telling you, before I owned a business, I would look at all these movies and I'd look at them for entertainment. Now I look at them with critical acclaim to see if that has any business application because yeah. they all do. They all do. It's yes. amazing. Yes. You learn. So the last question I have for you, Sean, where do we go find out more about you? How do we find out about you? Well, uh, with me personally, it's connectwithsean.com. Connectwithsean.com. And you're Sean is a little, me. spell your Sean for us. S-H-A-W-N. Oh, that's true. That's right. S-H-A-W-N. S-H-A-W-N. Connectwithsean.com. And by the way, if there's a wealth of information over there that you can pick up, it's all for free. If you can, you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to give you a free copy of this ebook that me and a couple of my colleagues just authored. And it's how to anything proof your business, basically. It came out of COVID, but it's about how to deal with any major disruption. Including ransomware on oil pipelines? Oh, wow. <laughs> right. Huh. <laughs> I've, I've had enough. ransomware issues. <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> yes. well, we, gotta, we have to have you back for another edition of this podcast. So thank happy. you so much, Don. I appreciate your insights. I mean, it was very valuable information you gave us. Thank you, audience, for listening in to uh, another edition of Building Better Businesses. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, Steve.